Warning, if you don't want to hear adult language, it's already too late to fuck off. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Adam and Eve and by Flaming Razor Hula Hoops. Flaming Razor Hula Hoops, because I will find a way to keep these motherfuckers at Kroger's six feet away from me. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, Scathing Atheists. Hi, indeed. I'm George Romacca. I'm Joe Dixon. We host Does This Still Work, the podcast. We're a good old popular entertainment and ask, does this still work? We just want to remind you, in case you need reminding, that we did, in fact, evolve evolve from from filthy filthy monkey people. people. It's June 25th. And it's National Chocolate Pudding Day. Uh, Yet another part of my childhood ruined by Bill Cosby. I just can't anymore Mm. with the pudding. I'm no illusions. I'm Heath Enright. And from Cincinnati Swing State and Good Husband Georgia, this is The Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, we'll learn that the odd-numbered amendments are the optional ones. (laughs) According to Trump, that includes the 13th plus one. Well, yeah, no, that one, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're both odd. They're both odd, yeah. And the Boy Scouts will finally get around to adding that mansplain merit badge. (laughs) But first, the diatribe. I will admit that the rhetorical deck is kind of stacked against us, even though we're the only ones telling the truth. And when you're trying to convince people of your side of an argument, being demonstrably correct is certainly an advantage. But for a lot of people, it's not definitive, especially when your truth is so much uglier than their lie. In a sense, we're always destined to be the asshole in the room because the lie is that your loved one is living on in paradise. And any attempt to puncture that lie is, to most people, a dick move. Right? How dare you take that comforting illusion away from people? In many ways, this question is more central to the religious debate than the one about God existing. And that's because to some people, it's the more important question. You know, Most of us live in countries where God has been defined down to a more or less impotent figure who could work in mysterious ways, but mostly doesn't. And that means that whether or not he exists isn't going to make any real difference in your day-to-day life. Right, He might be a moral arbiter, but since his moral judgment always lines up with your own, it doesn't really make a difference in terms of your behavior. Of course, you and I know better because we recognize all the fucked up consequences of theism, both for an individual and a society. But we're not trying to convince you and me. The people sitting on the fence often look at God like Russell's teapot. You can't prove him. You can't disprove him. And the world is the same whether he's there or not. And if you take religion from that angle, the one that incorrectly assumes the proposition of God to be neutral then atheism is nothing more than the asshole trying to take heaven away from Larry's grandma. But this all rests on the dubious proposition that religion, or more generally belief in an afterlife, helps people cope with death. I mean, I get how that intuitively sounds correct. As I pointed out many times before, there's no evidence that religious people actually are better at coping with death, right? They don't I don't seem to need less therapy or have less trauma or get over it any quicker or anything. But to be fair, that's almost certainly because they don't actually believe what they're saying they believe. Right. Clearly, if you really believed grandma was in heaven, you'd feel better than if you knew that she was just dead. Unless, of course, grandma was a horrible person and you've been looking forward to dancing on her grave for quite a while. But the point is that an apologist could argue that the whole reason religion isn't doing a better job helping people cope with death is because of the assholes like me that keep pointing out that the afterlife is a myth. In a sense, it's not fair to fault something for being ineffective if I'm out there actively trying to make it less effective. Now, the whole notion that everybody just needs to lie to themselves better brings up a host of complex moral questions that makes this a pretty precarious limb for apologists to just strand themselves out on in the first place, right? Like, If the entire world uh, agreed to lie and tell Larry that his recently deceased grandma was alive and well and he just missed her, she was just here a minute ago, we'd have made her death easier for him to cope with. But I don't think anybody would argue we'd behaved morally. But whether or not the ends justify the means, many people still carry around this misguided notion that we're the bad guys because the lie we're trying to expose is a comforting lie. But there's more wrong with this argument than its simple lack of morality. It also assumes that the belief in the afterlife only helps. That is not remotely the case. 
you know, consider, for example, that heaven is just half of the posthumous destinations Christianity has to offer. I mean, I guess that's different from denomination to denomination, but there's exactly zero of them where everybody gets to go to paradise, right? And even talking about the various beliefs between denominations has given Christian theology way more credit than it's due. Sure, there are some sects that have very specific rules and beliefs about the afterlife and believers that rigorously adhere to them, but most don't. Right. Like most Christians in the English speaking world have some sort of wishy washy theology that's mostly informed by Hollywood. You know, there's a heaven and there's most often a hell, but there are also ghosts and shit. And that's not just because some people are bad at their religion, by the way. The defense to keep the door open to the afterlife is nobody knows what happens when we die. The only answer that makes any sense is nothing and everything else is equally wacky. So to hold the door open for one branch of Christianity, we must also hold it open for all the ones with stricter heaven qualifications. We must also hold it open for reincarnation. We must hold it open for whatever weird-ass theology was going on in what dreams may come or ghost. If your argument is nobody knows and therefore you're patently absurd thing is possible all the other patently absurd shit is also possible this is not just a theoretical concession that you have to make in some larger argument this happens inside the brain of the christian you built your entire hope on the concept of doubting the obvious so you can't help but also doubt your hope right doubt is how you got there the other day i was sitting with a recently widowed christian friend A neighbor pointed out that some clock on her wall had stopped and the time it had stopped was around the time of her husband's heart attack the day before. She became convinced that the clock had stopped at the moment of his death and became so distraught that we had to take the clock down, put it in a closet. She had to take medicine. She needed to lay down. She desperately wanted to know what it meant. Now, you and I would know exactly what it meant. It meant the fucking battery ran out on the clock. Right. It was a clock that sat amongst 80 different trinkets on the wall that she almost certainly never looked at to figure out what time it was. There was a digital clock nearby. It had probably been stopped for days or even weeks. And it took a neighbor that doesn't normally come over to notice the clock was stopped. But because her mind was open to all these bizarre and inexplicable possibilities about death, she had to entertain any number of explanations beyond the mundane coincidence that was really behind this. Her belief in an afterlife did not comfort her in that moment. It did the exact exact opposite there are plenty of reasons why the lies of religion wouldn't be morally justifiable even if they did what they claim to do the fact that they don't makes the conundrum that much easier to dismiss they're talking about your jesus we interrupt this broadcast bring you a special news bulletin joining me for headlines tonight is the mandalorian to my baby yoda heath enright heath (laughs) can i handle your knob uh, do or do not, Noah. There is no time. <laughs> In our lead story tonight, one of the myriad scandals that would be the only thing we talked about on this show for two months under a normal presidential administration is the fact that as of this moment, the federal government is releasing our tax dollars directly into the hands of churches for the purposes of paying the salaries of their clergy. Literally happening. The only way to more thoroughly disrespect the intent of the First Amendment's religious protections would be to do the exact same thing while peeing on just that part of the Bill of Rights. <laughs> and then flushing 15 times. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we learned a, a couple of weeks ago that if the Trump administration has its way, we will never learn how much money went to which churches? And that came in the form of an announcement by Stevie, please don't call me Stevie Mnuchin, who announced that unlike all the other loans offered by the government, these ones were secret. Well, you know, we can't have other countries learning about our secret theocracy recipe. They might handle the pandemic better than us. That'd be a big problem. Yeah, can you imagine? I'm sure the- John Bolton will release a book about this. <laughs> So there are obviously legal questions about whether he can do this at all. And a dozen or so news agencies, plus the American atheists, have already sued the federal government for lack of transparency over this issue. Like even before Mnuchin announced his intent to stonewall across the board. But his excuse apparently is that unlike other government loans, the the PPP loans, the specific types being misappropriated to pay clergy are calculated based on employees salaries so giving away information on the specific amounts would also inadvertently reveal salary information about a whole bunch of people you see oh oh the salaries of 
key employees at tax exempt nonprofits, which are fucking public information from Form 990 that they have to give you if you ask for it. Mm. Can't reveal those. Is that the one he's talking well, about? Not all the tax exempt organizations Apparently have not. to. Oh, do they that. have different rules for some of those and not others? Strange. Fuck you. Yeah. 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 A couple of problems with that argument. Like, uh uh-uh, uh, and so fucking what? But even if it was all true, that would hardly justify keeping this information secret from the goddamn government accountability office, which Mnuchin is apparently also doing. And look, there are all kinds of reasons to be pissed about this, right? Like for all we know, the majority of the nearly $400 billion allotted to this program went to just Trump donors, right? For all we know, the money was funneled towards states and districts that voted Republican. And there's no reason to doubt that kind of corruption, given what we've seen out of this administration. But irrespective of the details, right? Yeah, I would. But irrespective of the details, we know that the amount going to churches specifically is far greater than no dollars at all. And by itself, that's a scandal worthy of a fucking gate suffix. Okay, even if we allow this obvious lie excuse about the salary information, you can tell us the total for each religion and for each denomination and each state, right? No yeah. salary gets revealed specifically by that. Well, right. And yeah, let's be super clear about this. Churches should be every bit as pissed about this as atheists are. Trump has already shown a clear preference for one branch of one denomination of one religion. And you're fucking crazy. If you think all the denominations are receiving funds equally or have access to them, let alone all the fucking religions. Right. Something tells me there aren't a hell of a lot of mosques getting approved and there's a super high chance evangelical churches are getting the lion's share of the money. And lest our love for euphemism disguise the point here, evangelical is not a denomination. It is a term (laughs) that pollsters and pundits use because white Baptist doesn't sound good. Yep. (sighs) All right. Next up in headlines, we have a follow up story about the religious liberty that we purchased in 2018 and how that investment is going for the American public. Oh, okay. Of course, I'm talking about the Religious Liberty Task Force. That's the government panel created by Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions that had some amount of people Mm -hmm. lasted for some amount of time, Mm -hmm. cost the American taxpayer some amount of money (laughs) and secured or enhanced or manufactured some (laughs) amount of religious liberty during their time. Yeah. Yeah. And according to the administration, the final results of that project are, go fuck yourself. It's a secret. Yeah, something of a theme in this week's headlines. Yeah. So, just in case anyone missed this when we yelled about it two years ago, the whole point of the Religious Liberty Task Force was to address the very serious problem of Jewish bakers getting forced to make swastika wedding cakes by jackbooted liberal thugs of the Obama administration. Yep. Apparently, Trump continued employing those thugs and weird the task force was a workaround to avoid firing those people not sure it's important to him that the administration doesn't have a big employee turnover <laughs> you know that. right yeah uh-huh. <laughs> and just by coincidence the goal of that jewish libertarian cake initiative aligned with christian business owners who were being persecuted into not persecuting mostly of gay people yeah in all seriousness The task force was Trump's early effort at cementing the evangelical vote for re-election by creating a committee to legalize bigot bakers and bigot adoption agencies and Kim Davis. Right. That's what that was. Yeah, exactly. And the SCOTUS was like, hey, we have a SCOTUS here. Right. Yeah. No, the the fucking (laughs) religious liberty task force job was to weed out all the uh, fucking Christian persecution in America and repel all of its tigers. Bunch of (laughs) bullshit. (laughs) So... So the task force started in July of 2018, but later that year, Jeff Sessions got fired, and then I'm pretty sure Trump just forgot about the task force, or maybe he got frustrated with all the complicated Bible-holding practice they made him do. (laughs) So it appears to be gone at this point, and now a whole bunch of government watchdogs and journalists want to know what the fuck they were spending money on, especially considering that protecting religious liberty was already a thing we did. Yeah. Well, Jason Leopold of BuzzFeed made a FOIA request that basically said, hey, Religious Liberty Task Force, what would you say you do here? Don't don't make me set up a meeting with the Bobs. So the administration sent him a big packet of the group's internal communication. Except 
pretty much the whole thing was redacted. Like, like they were building a cold fusion bomb to protect the segregated cake shop <laughs> sector, what and they the couldn't tell anybody. It's a national secret, national security. Redact. Nonsense. <laughs> All right. Well, to be honest, though, look, if nobody on this task force looked into a bomb that killed all the non-Protestant people, they were doing what Trump put them there to do. So there's that. (laughs) The holy hand grenade. Yeah. (laughs) So I looked at the documents just to see for myself. And Leopold is not exaggerating when he says it's all reacted. All the relevant information is missing. They even blurred out (laughs) the full page logo. That's all over this thing that they came up with for the task force. Fucking what? They, Jesus. Oh, you know what? I bet it's got a picture of Muhammad on it. <laughs> yeah. So. so, yeah, we don't know much, but we do have full confirmation now that they spent a good deal of their time drawing a coat of arms with Latin anti LGBT slur words on it and then blurring <laughs> it out. But information like who was involved in that task force and what the fuck they did and who they met with. That's all classified for national security. And we already knew it was just a bunch of bigots in a treehouse that said like, (laughs) no women allowed, no gays allowed. But now it's so much worse with this spy craft shit. Well, right, because they're not refusing to say how much they spent on it because it was so little. (laughs) Right. Exactly. And in fighting truth and nail news tonight, Christian hate monger and longtime father's shadow resident Franklin Graham is furious this week after Dr. (laughs) Anthony Fauci had the audacity to tell CNN's audience that, quote, science is truth just because those two words are synonyms. Right. Like, I know that the Tsarist doesn't exactly say that, but that's because they're trying not to piss off fucking Franklin Graham and the Graham crackers. But the science of the matter, the science will set you free. Nothing could be further from the science. I didn't change the meaning of any of those goddamn nope. things. Right. It fits. But Franklin Graham still got all pissy, despite the fact that Fauci was obviously and clearly telling the science. <laughs> yeah, this is the USA. We're all about. Science, justice, and the American yeah, Okay, no, it kind of, it kind of falls apart on <laughs> Well, yeah, but it does that whether you use truth or science. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the only one that's, um, that's not wrong there is tautological. <laughs> right. So the offending quote showed up when Fauci was called upon to explain the rise in COVID-19 cases that we're seeing in more than half of U.S. states. And after screaming, because you idiots keep bowling and getting tattoos and shit (laughs) in all caps italics for a minute, he lamented the fucking nation's anti-science bias, adding, quote, when they his whole life is all caps italics for a while. uh, It should be at least. Yeah. Right. So he says, quote, when they and that's talking about people with an anti-science bias, see someone who's talking about science. There are some people who just don't believe that. And that's unfortunate because, you know, science is truth. End quote. And Franklin Graham wanted to be super clear that he, for one, did not know. (laughs) Science is truth. And if you're curious about the list of idiots making the plague worse, we'll hear from them in three Two, one. Fuck you, Fauci. Yep, yes, Who exactly. Who I am? Franklin fucking Graham. Exactly. Yeah. Laid a trap. Perfect. <laughs> they all walked around the red X. Yep. Like they do. So Graham's response came in the form of a Facebook post, the thinking man's tweet, where he dismissed Fauci's <laughs> claim because science is sometimes wrong, which itself, by the way, is wrong. Science is perpetually incomplete and scientists are wrong, but the collective enterprise of gathering data, testing hypotheses and correcting our errors is truth, right? That's what that word means. In fact, it's so fucking true that it even admits how true it isn't. And if Graham was trying to make like a semantic distinction here or something, he might have a valid, if useless Mm. point. He was not. No, no. What he's trying to do is contrast science's truth with the demonstrably false claims of his dumbass mythology, which elevates him from wrong to lying. Yeah, just because of your fancy degree from Cornell, whatever the fuck, Jewish probably, I do not <laughs> take whatever you say as gospel science. Yeah. Fucking <laughs> Bass Arbird's asshole. Yeah, it's worth adding here, by the way, that one side of the argument claims infallibility and it's the same one that faults the other side for being fallible and has never been correct <laughs> right. about anything and has never corrected anything and has a book about how to best own slaves. Uh, so, that's in it. Just, yep. That's that's the them. <laughs> and in inclusions of grandeur news, 
the Boy Scouts of America just introduced a diversity and inclusion merit badge to the program in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Oh, fuck you. Yeah, yeah, fuck them, indeed. I'll get to exactly okay. why, but it's okay. probably obvious to everybody why <laughs> fuck them. I but mean, yes, yeah, fuck, I'm, I'm all in favor of inclusion and, and solidarity yeah. with Black Lives Matter. It's the Boy Scouts of America that can go fuck them. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Also, apparently they're still doing a system of physical badges that you sew onto your creepy fucking uniform because, you know, every kid wants to look like Idi Amin being a park <laughs> ranger in a fucking musical. But this is, like you said, mostly good news. Like, in, in theory, learning about diversity and inclusion is now officially a requirement for becoming an Eagle Scout, the highest rank at Boy Scouts of America. Yeah, right. No, as long as you keep it theoretical, though. <laughs> yes. So... One more time, I'm glad they're doing this, but in practice, the people who are going to be doing the diversity and inclusion training are the leaders of the Boy Scouts of America. Right. So we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm picturing like a David Attenborough narration about people of different races in their natural habitat. It's very upsetting. <laughs> I can't imagine Christ. it'll be a lot different from what I just pictured, <laughs> which I feel bad about picturing, honestly. Maybe if they have the kids tell them about diversity, I don't know. Yeah, that would be so much better. <laughs> so this is a group, by the way, just to circle back to why fuck you, a few other reasons. This is a group that didn't allow gay children to join until 2014 yep. and didn't allow gay adults to be scoutmasters until 2015. Except that last thing, they still don't do that all the yeah, time. Right, right. right now, they don't. They ended the national ban on gay scoutmasters in 2015, but they specifically said each local charter is allowed to make their own rules in accordance with their own beliefs. And just for the record, 70% of those charters are run by religious groups. Guess what they do? And speaking of which, this national organization that just announced their inclusion merit badge still has a complete ban on atheism right now yeah. in 2020. Right. Right, like, yeah, when you hear that the Boy Scouts are teaching about diversity, your first question should be for or against, right? And your first <laughs> assumption shouldn't be for. No. No. So the new merit badge was part of a big official statement from the Boy Scouts National Executive Committee. They're very proud of this. It's entitled BSA's Commitment to Act Against Racial Injustice, which, again, it sounds pretty good. But just in case there was any doubt about just how much worse than Michael Scott they're going to do with this diversity training. <laughs> the letter proudly, I guess, humble bragged, but not exactly. It proudly states that they banned the Confederate flag 30 years ago. 30 years. Yes. 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 30. <laughs> when yeah, I was It's 15. actually not even quite 30 years. It's less <laughs> than 30 years ago. So... Congrats on being a major player in the civil rights movement of like 1991, but you're still a bunch of bigots. And fuck you one more time. Oh, shit. Well, the Boy Scouts have a some of my best friends are black badge is what passes for good news around here. So we're going to pause for a second and tell you about this week's sponsor, Adam and Eve. So, Noah, you know what the best part of staying at home is? Uh is it the fact that I live in Georgia and my other option is going to the parts of Georgia that I don't pay to keep Georgians out of? No, it's playing at home is is what I was going to say. Your thing is the second best part, I guess. Oh, I mean, that's solid. Gotcha. Okay. Is, is that because Adam and Eve allows you to take advantage of the downtime and choose almost any one item at 50% off? It is because of that. Because not only are sex toys enjoyable, they're also better conversationalists than most of the people you meet if you go outside. Well, in Georgia, sure, yeah. I've never had anal mm -hmm. beads tell me all lives matter. Exactly. And if you use the offer code SCATHING, not only will you get half off almost any of their thousands of products, but you'll also get 10 free boredom-busting gifts, including six spicy movies, a three-piece bonus kit, and best of all, free shipping for all that stuff delivered discreetly right to your door. And all I have to do is remember to use the offer code SCATHING at checkout? That's right. Sex toys make being at home so enjoyable. Hell, even shopping from home is more fun when you're shopping for sex toys. So go to adamandeve.com and use the offer code SCATHING. Adam and Eve. I bet they wouldn't let me use any of the taglines I come up with. I, I have a few. 
And we're back. And in campaign in the ass news tonight, Trump's <laughs> re-election strategy for 2020 started to come into clearer focus over the last few days. Uh, now, obviously, we knew it would mostly consist of lying, corruption and xenophobia, but it remained to be seen what mix and form those ingredients were going to take. Yeah, fun game. How are you going to mix those? Man? Yeah, right, cool. right. But one clear theme emerging this week has been the very clear message that if Trump doesn't win re-election in November, there will be no more religion. <laughs> you promise? Yeah, Donald right. Trump? You can imagine. It. Wow. I don't know, though. Biden is still friends with Obama. We'll probably still have Islam. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Christianity's canceled. Right. Yeah, no, it's gone. Yeah, so we got this angle from a couple of different sources, and I think it's safe to say we're going to see this ramp up in the coming weeks to start with there's this interview trump recently did on the christian broadcasting network which right there that's like fucking info wars with an extra helping of jesus so that tells you all you need to know <laughs> but during the interview he's asked about the recent supreme court decision that admitted that firing women for fucking women when you wouldn't fire men for fucking women is sexist and, and he uses this to springboard into his you need me to appoint anti-gay judges even though one of his judges sided with the majority on that one. Yeah, so. you lost one there, didn't you, Donald? Yeah. yeah, that was fun. Oops. Also, by the way, translation of what Donald was saying there. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is social justice cancel culture gone too far. Yep. Also, the 14th Amendment is <laughs> yes, social so justice that, cancel culture gone too far. That one, too. Yeah, no, it's odd if you add it up correctly. We also got confirmation that this is a campaign-wide strategy when Trump legal advisor Jenna Ellis took to Twitter to warn the idiots who assume the sky is just going to stay up there all day. Quote, I'm going on record. I love this quote so goddamn much. I'm going on record now. If they try to cancel Christianity, if they <laughs> okay. try to force me to apologize <laughs> or recant my faith, I will not bend. I will not waver. I will not break. On Christ the solid rock I stand, and what? I'm proud to be an American. Okay. End quote. Wow. <laughs> If a fucking tweet could have fireworks. Anyway, she's clearly trying to trick people into thinking that she's responding towards some kind of thing of some uh, sort but I, this is to nobody yeah. yeah right this is literally no different than me taking a twitter to say that i will never lick my elbow no matter how many squids ride bicycles at me what the fuck are you even talking about <sighs> firework bald eagle like <laughs> as part of your tweet yeah <laughs> like she just started the usa the chant on twitter yes. in response to nothing <laughs> That is American exceptionalism right there. That's Isn't impressive. it, though? Isn't it? Oh, and as much as I'd love to say that this is a pointless strategy, it's worth reminding everybody that unofficial researcher of the scathing atheist Ryan P. Burge at all recently Ooh. conducted a survey where they found that 22 percent of Americans were worried that a Democratic president would literally ban the Bible. <laughs> And while 22% is nowhere near a majority, it's disturbingly close to enough to win a presidential election. So, wow. That's 22% of people watching Kirk Cameron movies as documentaries. Yep. Fantastic. Exactly. Next up in headlines, after a commanding victory and also a crushing defeat in a water chugging contest against himself <laughs> in front of... Dozens of loyal fans in Tulsa on Saturday. <laughs> hey, hey, tens of dozens, okay? <laughs> per perhaps tens of dozens, but oh, I'm, I'm going to say dozens. It's also dozens. It so is, yeah. <laughs> Donald Trump headed to the Dream City Megachurch in Phoenix, Arizona for another campaign event this week. And normally, you might think that's a big health risk during a pandemic. But don't worry. According to Pastor Luke Barnett of that church in Phoenix, they installed a new air filter system that kills 99.9% .9 of COVID units. Units yep. of COVID, 99.9% .9 are gone through ionization. What? Yep. Yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm impressed that he didn't just go ahead and say open bracket tech, close bracket. So. <laughs> yes, so... The name of the company that makes the new ionizer is called Clean Air EXP. And according to their website, you can control indoor air quality the same way a thermostat controls air temperature. No, you can't. 
<laughs> apparently you can set your clean air exp to remove only 50 percent of the covid if that's what you like, <laughs> like i like a nice six to five I don't make it too easy fun. Yeah. why would you have, have a dial on that thing that's insane but pastor barnett and their church cfo brendan zastro posted a video explaining how their new system works side note fuck you for having a cfo at your right. church get the fuck out of here cfo anyway According to Zastro, quote, it's ionization of the air. It kills 99.9% of COVID within 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't know what size room would be done in 10 minutes, but maybe all of them. I guess all, all of them. the rooms. Yep. It can do. Mm -hmm. It takes particulates out and COVID can't live in that environment. It needs particulates. So as long as everyone just inhales once every 10 minutes, Jesus Christ, if everybody, even if you were right, you'd still be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Fucking so, idiots. <laughs> so here's the thing, though, with COVID-19. It's not airborne. Yeah. It's spread mostly through respiratory droplets. And yes, the word respiratory has a, I, and R in it. And <laughs> you think of air, respiratory, breathing, air. But that's nothing. That's just nonsense associations. So unless everyone who needs to occasionally cough or speak or, I don't know, exhale from yeah, their lungs right. <laughs> in that entire church climbs into the HVAC system for each of those moments... And also everybody times it out so nobody has to exhale at the same time and encounter each other inside the HVAC system. Unless all that happens, the air filter system doesn't really matter. No. Ionization just means they're shooting the air that passes near the device with high voltage to give it negative charge, more electrons. The virus doesn't like fly around looking for air molecules Counting the protons and electrons, <laughs> making sure they're even, sometimes getting duped by the negative air. That's not what fucking, right, like, but the negative air is not like, we got particulates. Who needs particulates? <laughs> like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's, um, no, it rejects it because it's negative. Idiots. Look, and also, did, did you get rid of all the surfaces? Because I feel like you have to have surfaces. <laughs> I feel like all the things have surfaces. They're just, they're just grinding big surfaces into, into the ionizer. No, this isn't working. <laughs> this is negative surface. No, no, no. <laughs> just to be as fair as possible, not that they deserve this or have any idea what I'm about to say, but there are some studies that show a room with an air ionizer can reduce certain pathogens. But again, the airborne ones. Yeah. For COVID-19, everyone would need to be wearing like, a high voltage electron cannon over their face like Bane. <laughs> or they could wear a fucking regular cloth mask like all the doctors are recommending. That helps. Or they could not have a giant indoor meeting like all the doctors are recommending. I recommend both of the last two would be great. Yeah. Just lose <sighs> your election. You're going to lose. You're losing. <laughs> And speaking of which, in fringe benefits news tonight, just in case we needed any more confirmation that religiosity is not your friend when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic, the UK Office of National Statistics just released a report that shows that non-religious people are doing a much better job of not dying from the virus. Huh. Weird. Yeah. Now, granted, some of that's probably due to the correlation between religiosity and being old, right? But that's not enough to account for the statistical difference. So, yes, definitively... Religion makes you worse at being alive. <laughs> okay, but I will admit it. They are better at being dead. No, you're that's right. True. No, that's true. Like that's an true. atheist has never done a posthumous miracle and then got sainted. Like this. <laughs> certain know. things they do better dead. <laughs> All right. So the number they released specifically looked at the mortality rates between various demographics. When it came to religion, the lowest rates among both males and females were among the no religion category. The number was nearly 15% higher for both men and women in the Christian cohort and even higher in every other religious group except for other religion or not stated. Okay. All right. In fairness, though, religious people are always telling me, I'll pray for you. I feel like that's a factor oh, that's true. in helping out atheists. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I didn't even think of that one. We don't pray for that. Now, the explanation for why Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, and Sikhs are dying at a higher rate than Christians probably is the result of these other factors. Obviously, like most of those groups are going to contain a higher percent of recent immigrants. 
And that means that, you know, those groups are more likely to be lower income. They're more likely to live in areas with higher population density. And they're more likely to maintain cultural norms with a lot more group contact. And honestly, if increased chances of dying weren't damning enough for that country's Christian majority, those other factors should be. You'd think so. Yep. And finally tonight, an evangelical Christian soldier in the U.S. Army got indicted by a federal grand jury this week and charged with attempted murder, conspiring with terrorists, and I guess attempted magical treason or something like that after he got caught trying to help out a satanic neo-Nazi cabal of dark wizards. What? That all really happened. And in related news, our job is really weird. Yeah, but it's nice to know John Carpenter's still working, though, right? Like, he's in his <laughs> 70s. It was my job to see a headline, to look for a headline that said all that and be like, oh, this is perfect for my job. This is perfect. <laughs> Very strange. So the terrorist cabal is called the Order of the Nine Angles, or O9A. And according to Hope Not Hate, which is a watchdog that tracks hate groups, quote, O9A seeks to harness supernatural forces and overthrow the alleged Nazarene slash Magian, in parentheses, Jewish, influence on society. Also reduce the population of mundanes through acts of extreme barbarism. A uh, quick time out. That's uh, all, all those things I just said. A few words away from Eli describing how he hates normies. So that's fun. <laughs> really close. Anyway, continuing. And they also seek to usher in a new imperial aeon ruled by a race of satanic supermen who would colonize the solar system, <laughs> end quote. I have no idea how terrified of these people I should be, right? Like, it's, it's such some, a weird mix. Some, the answers, I, and it's more, more than answer. zero, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're dumb, but still. So here's what happened with this army guy, Private Ethan Melzer. Uh, I guess I should start by saying he grew up in Kentucky, so that's your first clue, that's your first problem. <laughs> And apparently the life for a white Christian guy in Kentucky is really hard. So he was having a hard time. He's very disgruntled. He Googled something like magic Nazi space travel and he <laughs> found O9A. Eventually he got deployed to Europe with the army and he started communicating with that group this April. Then in May, he told the terrorist group about where his unit was going to be so those dark wizards could ambush the unit. What? And then kill all the Jewish people in the world with magic is the rest of that plan. It's really, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's muddled. And apparently Melzer did this all on a so-called restricted messaging application. <laughs> he, he was, he was helping out neo-Nazi terrorists attack the U.S. Army and he figured, yeah, okay, I better get on WhatsApp. That's encrypted. I won't get in trouble now. <laughs> also, he was actually talking to an FBI agent the whole time. So of course he was. Yeah. Well, you know, if auditioning for a citation needed episode was a thing, that would explain all of this. As it stands, I have no fucking clue. <laughs> so any amount of neo-Nazi activity, like we we're saying before, that's at least non-zero scary, even if those neo-Nazis can't count to fucking nine. But don't worry, this particular group definitely will not be taking over the U.S. military to further their Aryan goals in outer space. Oh, only the guy we elected is doing that. Yeah. So the system yeah. Works. Wow. And now that we've accidentally discovered the group was started by Donald Trump and he meant to write angels the whole time, I think our work here is done. <laughs> Heath, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, we'll revisit the terrifying scissor gouging world of Sid Davis. In 2020, the world has gone out of its way to seem terrifying. But if you're feeling overwhelmed by the deadly virus, the police brutality, the murder hornets, the Nazi sympathizer in the White House, or whatever crazy shit this year is going to throw at us in July, you can always take comfort in the fact that the world you're living in will never be as terrifying as the one inside Sid Davis's mind. <laughs> Makers of such classic social guidance films as 
LSD, trip or trap, alcohol is dynamite, and seduction of the innocent. His was a terrifying world entirely populated by venereal disease, child molesters, and one-eyed children that only learn to respect the power of scissors the hard way. But he's one of our favorite subjects for a segment that we call God Awful Mini. 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 So tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We watched Girls Beware by Sid Davis. It's the sequel to his masterpiece, Boys Beware, which was a cautionary tale about the danger of child molesters. And Girls Beware is a very woke gender reversal exercise about the dangers of child molesters. Turns out, Sid Davis realized this, child molesters are not all gay like he assumed before. And despite all the problems with that, The general message of the two movies together is beware men. And that's honestly not the worst idea. That's true. It's the best one he ever put in a movie. Yeah. (laughs) Give him a little positive introduction there. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and ruin that. Noah, how bad was this mini? Well, if you like the missing child pictures on the milk garden, but you never get to find out where those bodies were found, you will love this mini. Jesus, it's so <laughs> fucked up. It's so fucked up. Oh. All right, so we're going to start this one. I was a little 10-minute video. We'll have it linked in the show notes. It's it's a fun watch if you like terrible things. So it starts off by setting a record, I think, for the least appropriate music for the message because <laughs> the words say girls beware, but the music says that those four dogs on each other's shoulders got a trench coat and now they're going to get into the club after all. <laughs> I, it felt like that was just the music that some people were playing in like the next room next to where the <laughs> right, shot, yeah, you know? exactly. It was so wild, and, and that there were four dogs that got a trench coat <laughs> to sneak into something. I don't know. Also, this starts with the, the title card for the title of the movie. It says "Girls Beware." Why can't they get a title card to hold still? I don't. Is that like technology we didn't have? Just put it on a table, put a camera on the table, and you're good for a second, right? You would think, but they didn't figure that shit out until the early 70s, I think. Yeah, right. No idea. So we get this shaky-ass Girls Beware title card. We get the shaky-ass in cooperation with the Inglewood PD and school district. I'm sure that's a point of pride for both of them. Yeah, kind of made it seem like there were other groups that did not cooperate. <laughs> you know, like it was kind of passive-aggressive. <laughs> Like, honestly, I expected the next title card to be like, and fuck the Rotary Club, Steve. (laughs) Fuck your stupid fucking Rotary Club, asshole. All right. So now we're going to meet our narrator, Norma Neufner, policewoman. (laughs) That's such a lie name. (laughs) Right? Norma. Well, yeah, Norma. Okay. Neufner. Neufner. I was like trying to see if it, the letters rearranged or if it spelled something backwards or something. Yeah. It doesn't. Uh, it's disappointing. I was just surprised they had police women in 1961. I didn't figure that was a thing. Well, yeah. so the, the, here's the thing though. In Boys Beware, it was a man cop telling us stuff. So now it's a lady cop. Sid Davis, very progressive. Right. Yeah. He did the woke gender reversal. Now he's got a female police officer. Good, good point. But, uh, she's like, yeah, I'm a police woman. No, I have sex with men, just to be clear. Uh, I take <laughs> I take the calls from hysterical us people. So yep, that's yeah. what I do. Exactly. Yes. She's working on the lady crimes. She doesn't even get she doesn't get like a badge or a, she's not a police officer, to be clear. Like we see her later on the job just wearing a dress, no uniform. Yep. Yeah. So she's on the phone with a mother worried about her missing daughter. And we're going to flash back to that missing daughter. This is Judy. Now, Judy is advertising her babysitting services at the supermarket. And she gets a phone call from a man she's never met that says he'll be there by to pick her up for a babysitting job in 15 minutes. Right. And mom and dad aren't home at this moment. So Judy leaves a message on that, like, super important notepad next to the phone. Like, (laughs) this, the telephone and notepad culture was crazy serious. Like, we caught the end. Oh, yeah. Did you have that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My parents were so fucking serious about correctly noting whatever you you answer every phone call right away. Oh, so I always got in trouble for taking the pencil, right? Like, because if I needed a pencil, I would take that one and no, no, the fuck I wouldn't. But yeah. Oh, I yeah, I, I learned that lesson real fast. Dad stretching the co- the cord to the phone one time trying to get a pen or a pencil that wasn't quite close enough. Staring at you the whole time. Furious, yeah. Spitting right, and screaming. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and also, by the way, this apparently took place back in the era when bow tie wasn't exclusively a gimmick or a quirk because the child molester that picks her up <laughs> has bow tie. Just disturbing. That's a clue. I'm sorry. That's got that needs to be a clue all the time. <laughs> all right. So now we get Judy's mom coming home. She finds the note. She follows up. She calls the number and it's just some random lady. And the video feels the need to show us some random lady. <laughs> yeah. Right. Also, we don't need the narrator and the movie. Yes. Just as right. a concept. Like <laughs> they landed on this insane compromise. We're watching movie clips with no audio and a narrator explaining what's very clearly happening on the audio in the clip that we're watching. Just use it's it's a right. strange. Yeah, thing if you would on. shut up and let this lady talk, she could tell us what's going on. <laughs> right. right. But so the mom calls this number and it turns out it's just a fake. It's like a random number. Mm. So some woman picks up and is like, yeah, I have no idea about your daughter. I, I get these calls all the time. I think, I think a kidnapper just writes like. Eight six seven five three zero nine is his go to <laughs> fake number, and that's me. And like, I don't know. Yeah, but mom is curiously nonplussed by this. By midnight, though, she starts to get worried. I'm like, by fucking midnight? That's so slow, right? Really? Yeah. You know already. As soon as you make this phone call, okay, this is a kidnapper giving an obvious fake number. What other scenario was there? Right. Like, or at least it was your like, it, it's your daughter lying so she could go hang out with her boyfriend or something. Yeah. She kidnapped herself. <laughs> no, a fake kidnap, but like a prank by her hilarious daughter from 1961. That's that's great if that's what Judy. No, that we find out very quickly. No. And then because this is a Sid Davis movie and Sid Davis doesn't fuck around, the narrator's like, a week later, we found her rotting corpse picked clean by buzzards <laughs> along a lonely desert highway. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, we're still listening to the cartoon dog music the entire time. It does not stop. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Something so fun is happening next to this movie. Yeah, so fun. right. <laughs> so, okay. And then Norma has to go break the news to Judy's mom. And here's the actual line from the video. You can never find the right words to tell a mother that her daughter has been murdered. Yeah. Um, What would that even mean? And secondly, do you nail it when it comes to telling moms about their murdered sons? Are you better with dads? Why? That seems oddly That's... specific in terms of nouns. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird to make that distinction. But yeah, that's a tough conversation. Just like, okay, so funny story. Nope. Nope. Okay, that's a bad start. <laughs> uh, a great philosopher. No, no. Uh, uh, according to the Oxford Webster's English Dictionary, Dictionary. defines murder rape. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's apropos. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and then the, the narrator comes on and, and, and goes like, you know, Judy never did anything wrong. She was just careless in who she trusted. It's like, yeah, he was wearing a fucking bow tie. You should have, you should have known. That. Yeah, dude, Tucker Carlson shows up to pick you up. You've never met him before. <laughs> Don't get, that's ridiculous. Right. Fuck out of here. Is that a bow tie and a monocle? What do you do? Are you, are you an evil Kentucky colonel? You have to tell me. Are you carrying around a Persian cat to stroke? Hold on a second. <laughs> so, yeah. So now we meet Barbara, the gallant to Judy's goofus. Right now. Right. Barbara is out. Uh, she's she's babysitting one night and a guy comes by to murder rape her and she sends him next door. <laughs> well, yeah. So the the narrator cop is like. All right, I'm not saying it was your dead daughter's fault, but Barbara is a great example of how not to get murdered. And literally, yeah, apparently a sexual predator shows up to the front door while while Barbara's home by herself. And she's like, ah, try the next house over. See if you can get any success yes, going there. Right, it's not yeah, they're careless with their children. <laughs> what? <laughs> I wanted the neighbors to come over and just be like, hey, did you fucking send this guy? <laughs> To our house? Are you serious? I sent him to your house. You sent him to my house. All right. This is funny. All right. What about asshole across the street? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there we asshole go. Asshole across the street. And teach him to mow his fucking lawn. And okay. So now we meet Sally and Elizabeth at the movies, right? And these two older boys, they, the fucking narrator describes them as older boys that would like to be their first. They're fucking men. Right, that's the, the term for that much older boys. These are forty-five-year-olds. Yes, but also giants. They're like <laughs> seven feet tall, and they show up at this theater full of kids. Really upsetting. 
and they want to be friends with Sally and Elizabeth and they like lean over the thing and then they jump over the seat and they're sitting next to him. It's very creepy, the whole thing. Well, and the narrator says, this is the weirdest line in the whole fucking movie. The narrator says, friendships are easily made in a crowded theater. <laughs> right. Are they? How so, the movie? Like, people start shouting across the crowded theater like, so what kind of music do you listen to? <laughs> what? What kind of music? Never mind. Okay. Does anyone in my area closer want to be friends? No? I'm a giant. I'm 45-year-old giant. <laughs> yeah, and so the, the lies like they were secret. The two girls were secretly pleased that two older boys talked over the movie in an unsolicited effort to flirt with them. And I'm like, oh, Sid Davis wrote these lines, didn't he? Yep, sure did. Sid, a man wrote yeah, hey, those lines. Girls, beware of Sid Davis. That's what we learned yeah, right there. right. So then during intermission of the movie. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Did movies have an intermission? I, I guess. Is that a thing? I guess in 1961, that's when this movie came out. Yeah. Back in the day of the 23 cent hamburger, apparently movies had intermissions. Wasn't everybody smoking like four cigars in the theater already? What did they need? Yeah, <laughs> right. For? Yeah, exactly. But during intermission... Sally showed off to all of her friends all this mature dick she was swinging around on. And then the older boys offered him a ride. Now, Elizabeth knew better, right? She tried her best to cock block Sally. Yeah. But it didn't work out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Elizabeth's pretty great here. <laughs> the guys are like, oh, you ladies need a ride home. And she's like, nope, we got a ride. <laughs> and Sally's like, hey, Elizabeth, I, I think they want to hang out with us is what that meant. And she, she's like, nope, we're 14. You're 45. Please leave. Mm. So good. And then finally it was like, all right, what if we just give Sally a ride home alone? <laughs> and Elizabeth, she's like, that doesn't really, doesn't really make any sense. I said, my parents are already giving us both a ride. Like, why would we both have cars going to the same place? <laughs> she's my fucking favorite. All right. So, so now we cut to Sally in the front seat sandwich between the two boys here. And she's pretty impressed with them, like, having a car and, you know, an IRA. <laughs> did, did cars just have, like, a bench in the front for a long time? They did. Yeah. Bench seating. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, no, it's just, just a big-ass fucking couch in the front. Okay. I guess I've been in some trucks like that. But, yeah, yeah. I just you don't you don't picture it with cars. Okay. Old-timey movie stuff. <laughs> right. But these boys drove right past her house and straight to Lookout Peak. And that's when she knew she was in trouble. Now, I don't want to make a joke about this scene because what they're trying to show is like apparently these two boys gang raped this girl, right? And not Something a lot of horrible like that. Yeah. Yeah. Not a lot of humor in that. And there shouldn't be. But the way that, of course, it's a fucking 1961 movie that they're going to show in schools. They can't talk about that. They should, but they can't at that point. So what they do to, to like show you that that's happening is both of these men going to kiss this girl at the same time? At, yeah, at the same time. They bump heads. Like, we watch right, yes. them smash heads like cartoon characters. It seems like you just do all the permutations one at a time. You know? <laughs> I don't. I, the, the logistics of that fucked me right up. <laughs> you guys are going straight for the DA. All right, all right. I just yeah. feel like we can work up to that. Just <laughs> like rock, paper, scissors or something. <laughs> All right, so by midnight, her parents started to worry because that's when parents start to worry, I guess, right? <laughs> it's it's legally just a date until then in 1961. Like, kidnapping doesn't count until midnight. Yes. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So they call Elizabeth. They find out that, you know, she took a ride home from these boys, and that's about the time the cops found her walking dazedly home from Lookout Peak. The, the fucking narrator says it was a night they'd all remember. I'm like, that's a weird way to describe a rape. But yes, I'm sure it is. Yeah. And hey, uh, maybe the police just go to Lookout Peak instead of patrolling the walk home. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. All right. So now we're going to cut to our final example here. This is where we're going to cut over to the soda shop to remind you that rape is hiding everywhere. By the way, burgers were 23 cents back then. It says that on the sign and that's all I could focus on for a second. It's like, it's so antiquated that I didn't even know how to make a cent symbol on Google Drive. I almost had to put like dollars <laughs> $0.23. <laughs> yeah, the problem with this for me was all I wanted, like all I can think about for the rest of the movie was I want 
burgers, malts, fries, chicken, fish, and shrimp. Which yeah. it's a, it's a, <laughs> yes, all in those that order. <laughs> I'm that guy who shows up and is like, technically the sign says 23 cents for burgers, malts, fries, chicken, fish, and shrimp. <laughs> if you want to get technical, I would like all those things. Very here small on my 23 amount. 23 pennies. Of each of yeah. those, yeah. But this is the malt shop where Mary met Robert. Now, Robert is uh, the fucking is to malt shops as Roy Moore is to Hot Topics, apparently. Right. <laughs> That's the guy. And the narrator, mm. I love the narrator, Norma Neufner, so much right here because she just lays into this motherfucker, right? She is so roasting this son of a bitch from the second. She's like, immediately he's on screen. She's like, and here's this motherfucker right here. <laughs> finished high school, no fucking job, living in his mom's basement. But yeah, he's... uh creepily saying hello to high school girls and he's like well, 19 or 20. Yeah, was, and, and I don't even know if if high school girls is like this girl actually looks like 12 or 13. The other girls Actually, look, yes. This, this one is middle school. Yes. Yeah. I would say if I had to name an age, 11, super, 12. Super super fucking young. Yeah. Terrifying. So this one was kind of disturbing. Yeah. But Mary was sure impressed that the older boy wanted to talk to her. Uh so she <laughs> rode off with him. So Robert goes in for the, they, they show the two of them at a, at a park and we see Robert go in for the kiss and the camera turns away, you know, like, because that's, it's, it's a grown fucking man and a little girl and they don't want to actually have to have this happen. So the camera turns away, which is good, except it's like so goddamn fast and embarrassed to be there. It's the most jarring pan I've ever witnessed outside of one of those camera phone things in a natural disaster, <laughs> right? <laughs> the movie literally looks the other way while a grown man kisses a <laughs> That's what happens here. Well, I, okay. And and then we get this bizarre fucking ending. And this is the whole reason we're doing this movie is because of the way it ends. We should now show the dire consequences of, you know, whatever just happened. We're not going to talk about what it was, right? And the dire consequences apparently involve this girl being pulled out of school and taken away from her parents. Okay, that's what I thought they said. That's insane. Like, what is the movie telling? What is the movie trying to say here? I don't know. Right. Because it, it's like it, it, the, the movie comes on. And she's like, well, finally, she told her parents what happened. But by then it was too late for advice. What? I have no idea what the fuck that means. And then they said she had to be, quote, taken out of school and placed under the guidance of juvenile authorities for getting raped. God, the 60s were fucked up. So the moral is there's a there's a line after which you don't tattle on your molester or else I, you end up in a foster home. What right. The fuck's yeah, happening? exactly. I don't fucking know. It, it, and like, by the way, the whole thing ends by zooming in on a file, which is presumably Mary's permanent record. Right. So it's just ominous. And then everyone will always know you've been raped. Kind of a moment at the end of this terrifying shit. Those aren't real, right? There's no permanent record. I'm Pretty sure there's not. I hope it's certainly okay. hope there's not. And quick before I'm called upon to summarize the moral of that story, we're going to close the mini off until next time. Don't forget, everyone's trying to kill you and you are in perpetual danger. Don't worry, Sid, I'm keeping it alive. Before we lay me down to sleep tonight, I wanted to let you know that Eli is set to make his triumphant return next week. He's been off for a while, but don't worry. He's been dealing with a bunch of smelly shit indiscriminately smeared where it shouldn't be this whole time. So, you know, he's been keeping in practice to do headlines when he gets back. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday and an even new episode of our half sister show Citation Needed debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd be embarrassed to show my voice around here next week if I never I'd like to thank Heath, the plural of Hooth, and Lucinda, the plural of Lucindum. I also need to thank George and Joe from the Does This Still Work podcast for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. Got to admit, I haven't checked out the show yet, but after listening to Heath and Eli realize what a bunch of shit Boondock Saints was in real time, I'm fascinated by the concept. If you want to get ahead of me on the homework, you'll find a link to their show on the show notes for this episode. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most marvelous mammals, Jeff, Dale, Ken, I Got Fisted by Jesus, Doing Etruscan episode, you cock tease motherfuckers, and the trans woman, Aaron and Jose. Jeff, Dale, and Ken, whose erections bend light, fisted by Jesus in Etruscan episode whose IQs have more ones and zeros than the internet and Anne, Aaron, and Jose who are so hot fires huddle next to them. 
Together, these eight amiable atheists aided our aims to alienate the Abrahamic a-holes this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the illiterate qualities it takes to give us money, but if you're up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation to patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help but money and you aren't on speaking terms, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, or following at PIATPod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media. Our audio engineer is Morgan Clark. We also wrote all the music that was used for this episode and was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Anyway, got to learn the force push. Right? The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.